Well, good morning. We are in the 16th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we begin this week with verse 23. Well, you have to indulge me for a second. I have a very special guest this morning that I didn't know was here. My niece, Sarah Heineke. Sarah, stand up, please. I want everybody to see how beautiful you are. Very godly young lady who is like a daughter to me. Very special. She's traveled in from Houston to come hear the word encourage her old uncle. Proverbs 16.23 We have uh, two Proverbs, 23 and 24, on competent speech. And then uh, when we come to 25, we begin a new section on wisdom for daily living. Okay, here is our uh, Proverbs. I probably ought to begin by asking you to set a couple of tabs, really three. I'm going to try to keep this as simple as possible this morning, but these will really add and supplement our study this morning. The first is in Isaiah 53. If you'll just set a tab right there. The second is in Hebrews 2. And the third is in Romans chapter 3. So that's Isaiah 53, Hebrews 2, Romans 3. And I'm going to show you a real treasure that I found from a proverb this morning. Verse 26. And the appetite of the toiler. I'm going to use those verses. Okay, here we begin in verse 23 this morning. The heart of the wise causes his mouth to be prudent. We remember that word, prudent. 2 Chronicles 2, uh, Tyre, the uh, king of uh, Sidon, sent lumber to Solomon and sent him letters and said... uh, God has made you king over your people because of his love for the people. That's prudence. It is seeing things from a proper perspective. And that's how the word is used. So here we have prudence. Verse 23, the heart of the wise comes uh, from his mouth to be prudent, and on his lips he will add learning. Here's 24. Pleasant words are overflowing, honey sweet to the soul, and a remedy to the bones. Remedy to the bones. Now we move into wisdom for daily living. Verse 25, there is a way that is right in a person's judgment, but in the end it is ways of death. It is to the ways of death. And then 26. The appetite of the toiler works for him. Surely his mouth urges him on. I'm not going to go to 27. I put that in the bulletin because 26 is going to absorb the majority of our time today. Now let me tell you how we're going to study and understand these Proverbs. Here is 23. Here is what I think it is teaching. Learning how to be an encouragement to others. Learning how to be an encouragement to others from a proper perspective. See, that's the word prudent. From a proper perspective. Here's 24. Words can hurt, and words can heal. Words can hurt, 
Words can heal. Here's 25. Personal thoughts. Personal ways. Are inferior. To direct guidance from the word. Your personal thoughts. Your personal ways. Are inferior. To personal guidance from the word. Follow the word, not your feelings, not your thinking. And here's 26. The worker is Christ. Now, here's 23. The heart of the wise. You see, what's in our hearts or what's come, is what comes out of our mouths. The prudent, which are the wellspring, gives out through the heart. They speak through the heart. And that is absorbed with skill, wisdom. And that's why it has real stirrings among us. Really makes an impact, an impression. Lips, which is another reference to the mouth, finishes the proverb. Here in the same fashion is 1621, which we just previously studied. That word adds. It's the word translated increases. It was used by Joab to give a benediction to David. Now may the Lord add to your people in the kingdom. That's the word. Adds learning. The skillful mouth should be filled with blessing. Remember, wisdom is skill. We learn skill by practicing it all the time. Our mouth should be filled with blessing to increase learning and understanding. That's the idea of Proverbs 27.9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, so is a man's counsel to his friend. You see, it stirs his friend. It moves his friend. It makes an impression. And the proverb is saying, learn to do that. Learn to do that. How do you do that? The gift of encouragement is in the New Testament. Titus 1.9, hold firmly writes the apostle to the trustworthy message that has been taught. Now here is the purpose clause for that. So that you can encourage, encourage others. The Greek word parakleo, to beseech, to exhort, to strengthen. First Thessalonians 5.11, therefore encourage says the apostle, one another, edify, build up one another, even as you do. Now look at the proverb. How does the skillful mouth encourage? With prudence. You see, the ability to see a matter from a proper perspective. How does that work? Hey, you know, there is so and so, and they lost their husband, and I need to be, I need to reach over and say something to them. I need to be an encouragement to them. Here's here's somebody that's going through a medical test. I need to, I need to speak to them in the proper perspective regarding that matter. Encourage one another. Be about it. That's the proverb. The source of refreshment, the skill, the wisdom is how can I build you up today? That's the ministry and that's the proverb. Here's 24, our conclusion for now on competent speech. Pleasant words are overflowing honey. The importance of the use of words. Words can hurt, words can heal. A unique observation from Solomon here in the proverb. An overflowing mass of honey. 
that would make the comb itself look superfluous. It's David's thought. Psalm 19.10, he says, The commands of God are more precious than gold, than pure gold, sweeter than honey. See, they stir us. Words stir us. They, They make an impression upon us. They leave a stamp with us. Proverb, pleasant word, sweet. And look, a remedy. You see that? For the soul, the word remedy is actually the word to heal. This is what the Lord says. 2 Kings 2.21 I have healed. Here's our word. Proverbs 16.24, I have healed this water, never again will it cause death or make the land unproductive. Remedy, heal. That's your word, that's your mouth. Here's your illustration. One of the few books I have read before I was a Christian, I read a lot of Sports Illustrated. But uh, one of the few books I read, I lived on cliff notes for my English literature, uh, was from cover to cover. It was Jerry Kramer's Instant Replay. Jerry Kramer, the great Hall of Famer, just made the Hall of Fame a year or so ago, a guard for the Green Bay Packers, and made that crushing block on Jethro Pugh in the ice bowl for the Green Bay Packers to win the championship. Bart Snar st- seeking, sneaking over from the one-yard line and it made Jerry Kramer famous. And uh, so he wrote a book, Instant Replay. And it was about his life growing up, but living with Vince Lombardi and how he fashioned the team and made them champions. It was a fabulous book for anyone that was acquainted with football and ever played the game. But he tells a story that I never forgot. And it's a great illustration of remedy and heal. It was about the third week of the training camp, and it was a hot day in Wisconsin. And he was thinking, I'm going to make this team. I'm really doing pretty well. He goes out on the practice field, and he said from the moment he touched the grass, for some reason, Vince Lombardi, this particular day, was on him on him in calisthenics, on him in every drill, on him in every play. It was like he said, no one was out there but me. It was I couldn't do one thing right. And it went on for two hours and 15 minutes. He was on me running at the end. And I went into that locker room and I sat down and I started thinking seriously about my life, what I'm going to do, where I'm going to go. This is obviously not for me. And suddenly, he said, I was so exhausted I couldn't even pull my shoulder pads off. I felt this pressure on my right shoulder pad. And then... Coming into the left ear, I heard this all familiar voice. You are going to be one of the greatest linemen to ever play the game. It was the voice of Vince Lombardi. (laughs) And those words instantly healed. They were a remedy. He said, I was invigorated. I was ready to go out and practice. And from that point in time, he said it was a watershed in my career. My everything changed in relationship to him and becoming a champion of the Green Bay Packers. That's the word here. Heal. Now look at this. The the final words here of the proverb, to the bones, it's a figure, a reference a part of the whole. You see, 
that's uh, Semitic literature. They take the hand, and the hand represents the whole person, the leg, so forth. Here are the bones. It represents the entirety of the person. It's a figure. The bones are the person. What is the point? Good speech, pleasant words, often bring healing instantly to a situation. Remember now, in the book of Proverbs, tone is important. How you speak, what you say, the soft word, the soft answer, breaks the bone. It's effective. It leaves an impression. And that's the proverb. Here's 25. There is a, we know this one, don't we? There is a way that is right in a person's judgment at the end of it is the way of death. Here is a proverb that you are probably very familiar with. It's a repetition, really, of 1412. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. Since we studied that proverb, we will be very brief regarding this one. What human perception thinks is the right way ends up in dire consequences. Oh, this is what I should do. This is where I'm led. Well, how do you know that? Are you, are you seeking the Lord in the Word? The book of Proverbs consistently says that the wicked path is always crooked. It looks inviting, enticing. The wicked path. But you see, the Proverbs are very clear. Stay on the path. It's the byways. It's turning aside to the left or to the right. That's where you get into trouble. So often I've said to people, how did you ever think you would find joy and happiness and peace? You're just drag racing down a dead end street. The counsel of the proverb is never straight. Stay on the path. There's no formulas to the Christian life. There's a day-to-day -day walk. And blessing will come in your life over and over again. And that's what this book tells us. Proverbs. Don't depend on your thinking. Your thinking, John Calvin says, is an idle factory. It's right up here. You make them all the time. Instantly. That's, that's part of the fall in us. Follow the word. Hear the word. and That will give you guidance and direction for the rest of your days. Now we come to 26. The appetite of the toiler works for him. Surely his mouth urges him on. The original toiler, worker, in the book of Proverbs was the ant. Proverbs 6. His works were fostered on by his need to survive. So he planned ahead and he diligently worked to accomplish that. Notice in the proverb here, the appetite is contrasted to the mouth. Do you see that? Solomon, our author, gives us a similar proverb in the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 6 and verse 7. And there he uses some of the same vocabulary. Here's what he says in Ecclesiastes. All of man's efforts are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. The Ecclesiastes Proverbs depicts the natural man as he is. Self-centered, selfish, life from sunrise to sunset is all about him. And that's... His observation is in Ecclesiastes. And yet, his proverb there says that that type of person is never satisfied. It's 
futility is what he's telling us. He never relieves his hunger. Everything is for his mouth. The futility of life apart from God. It's this character with this enormous mouth shoving everything into it. And yet, never appeased. Crazy. That's what we say. One of the great quotes of Christian history comes from Blaise Pascal. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God made through Jesus Christ. Ah, what a good word. That's man's natural condition. Notice in our proverb the appetite here. It's the same word as the word soul found in verse 24. What does that mean? It means the inner craving of both physically and mentally the person. This is the way you are physically and this is the way you think, says Solomon. That's why a timely word And the providence of God is so important to us all. How we think, how we function, how we move. Words that inspire. Words that move us. Words that we hang upon. We think of the great Winston Churchill, World War II, steals the mind of the British citizen. I don't have a turkey on your dining room plate to offer you. Here's what I have to offer you. Blood, sweat, toil, tears. Hardening the mind, preparing them for the Nazi invasion, perhaps, or the bombing for sure. Just recently, we we celebrated the fall of the Berlin Wall, 30 years. And we all remember That speech given by Ronald Reagan at the Brandenburg Gate, June 12th, 1987. General Secretary Gorbachev, if you seek peace, if you seek prosperity for the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, if you seek liberation, come here to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Words that inspire us, grip us. You see, that's Nehemiah 2.17. He says to the people in Jerusalem, in the midst of the rubble of their wall, let's rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Sounds rather flat, doesn't it? I bet it was an inspiring message. Here's how we know it had a bite to it. That it really had a 3D dimension to it. He says at the end that we would not be a disgrace. Here you are. The people of God. The people of God. In all the world. The revelation given to you. And look at you. You're living in rubble. Christian, you're living in rubble. Fix it. Follow the Word of God. Fix it. Live a life that honors Him. Rebuild your wall. Now, verse 18 follows up with his own testimony about his gracious God and his hand upon him, but that was the message of Nehemiah. Here we come to the toiler. Now, the toil, the work. The word means burdensome labor. In some occasions, it's defined as what the work is. We say to one another, let's go to work. We know what that means. It means let's exhaust ourselves to energy. That's what it means. And here's the end of the proverb, the second line. Surely a word 
to clarify the top line here. The standard Hebrew lexicon translates the word urges as a strong assertive force. A strong assertive force. It's used in Exodus 2.14. After Moses killed an Egyptian who was beating an Israelite, he goes out the next day and he finds a Jew, same one fighting, and he separates them. And the one who was in the wrong, he says to him, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And here's the man's response with this word, Proverbs 16, 26. Who made you, he said, a strong, assertive voice over us? That's your word. It means that God places within us to be productive so that we might accomplish his will. Now, Going through this proverb, and you know, you study these words, and sometimes you find that they lead you into a gold mine. And that's what I found here. I found an actual gold mine with this word. I want to show you how it's used in the book of Proverbs. The toiler is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me show you that. The first verse that I want you to look at is Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, 11, a very famous passage from the Old Testament concerning the pre-incarnate Christ, the suffering Messiah. And it says this, by Isaiah the prophet. He shall look upon the travail. Your translation might have anguish, might have suffering. It is the word to toil. It is the word to work. Proverbs 16. He will look upon the work of his life, says the prophet, and be satisfied. What is the verse? The verse is God the Father looking down upon that mass of blood and whatever flesh is left hanging upon that cross suspended between heaven and earth and He will look upon that and He said, that satisfies me. Me, God the Father. That's the verse. Now, to be sure, To be sure that that's the word, we have it again in the Proverbs 27.20. Beginning in 19, as water reflects the face, so the heart reflects the true man. Your translation, death and destruction, are never, and here's the word. It's repeated twice in Proverbs 27.20. Are never satisfied. Same word as Isaiah 53, 11. Now about 40 years ago, Leon Morris wrote a very important book that appears to be out of print today. It's entitled The Apostolic Preaching of the Cross. It was a compendium of word studies on very important words associated with the death of Christ. We had the word substitution. We had the word redemption. We had the word expiation. And we had the word, New Testament word, propitiation. Propitiation. It's the idea in the New Testament that the death of Jesus Christ fully satisfied the demands of a righteous God in respect to the judgment of a sinner. Here's a good word picture for you. Propitiation. It surprised me when I found it. It was the parable of the tax collector and the righteous man, the holy man. Luke 18, called the prayer of the publican. Remember, the holy man was standing in the temple and he was lifting up 
his eyes and saying, thank you that you didn't make me like other men. Then there's this tax collector, the hated tax collector. He's over here. He's not looking up, said Jesus. He's looking down. Not only is he looking down, he is smiting his breast. And he says to me, Oh God, be a propitiation. Now your translation has mercy, has pity. But it's propitiation. Here's the way the Old Testament scholars describe that word from Isaiah 53. The word to work that's associated with it. It is satisfied as to a given result. What does that mean? It means you can't add anything to it. Don't dot an I. Don't cross a T. It's done. It's finished. It's already accomplished. That's what the, the scholars say the word satisfied represents. Now, now we're in it. Now I want you to look at another And that's why I wanted you to turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Because in Hebrews chapter 2, we have the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews describing for us the humanity of Jesus Christ. You see, we've talked about propitiation. And we've talked about His work, which is toil and suffering. And you cannot understand Jesus Christ without understanding that that work is very much tied to his person. The person qualifies the work and vice versa. They cannot be separated. And so the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews, he's explaining that to us in Hebrews chapter 2, beginning in verse 17. Look at this. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers in every way, he writes. And here's the purpose clause. Look at the purpose clause. Why must he be made like his brothers in every way? Why? Why? Because he must be a complete human being. That's why. So when he hungered, he hungered just like you do. And when he thirsted, he thirsted just like you thirst. And when he saw the color red, he saw it just like you see the color red. You see, he was made like his brothers, human beings, fellows in every way. And so there's a purpose to that, said the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews. Look at this, very important, that he might become. I'm so glad Alan is with us today because the King James, the authorized version, has a much better translation. Be. It's a better idea than become. Because the word become, it gives you the nuance, the notion of evolving, trans transporting oneself from this to that. That's the idea, the notion of become. But it's, but you see, here's why that's a difficult translation and a difficult understanding because you see, your God is immutable. He can't change. So you have incommunicable attributes and communicable. The communicable ones like jealousy and love. You understand those. They're human emotions. The human dilemma relates to them. Incommunicable. Ah, that's where he's other. Now, he's sovereign. He is immutable. You're not immutable. He can never change. So what is this become? From the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews. Well, he becomes not in essence, but in a unique purpose. A purpose 
like never been done before in the history of all creation. And here it is. You're out there on that cold night outside of Jerusalem, and suddenly the sky lights up, and here come the angels and the anthem, and they sing glory to the God of hosts. We have great tidings for you. For now, this very God who cannot change is now Emmanuel. He's human flesh. And He's with us. Among us. Wonder of wonders. Mystery of mysteries. This immutable God has taken to Himself an additional nature. Now made just like us. He is for now and evermore the God-man. That's who He is. The toiler is the God-man. And, the, and He must be that man to become a purpose, said the writer to the epistle to the Hebrews. And what was that purpose? Look, look what He says. That He might be a propitiation, a satisfier. Just exactly what Isaiah the prophet wrote hundreds of years before. So let's finish the verse. A faithful high priest in the service of God. What does a high priest do? He goes into the Holy of Holies. He offers atonement. That's propitiation. He sprinkles the blood on the altar between the cherubim. And who did he do that for? The Moabites, the Edomites, the Philistines? The Egyptians? No, he did it for the people of God. His people. That's who he did it for. Now here's your third verse. So we're going to finish this all out. And we're going to snap the pieces of this together. And it's all going to make sense. And that's why we need Romans 3.25. Romans 3.25. Speaking of Jesus Christ, here's what the apostles said. God presented Him as a propitiation. Your NIV says atonement. The New American Standard, the King James, they translate it correctly. A propitiation. What does the word mean? It means that the demands of a righteous God are fully met, fully satisfied in reference to judgment. You see, that was the labor of Christ. That's what He did. He was the toiler. He did the work. Look at this verse. Again, this was to show, said the apostle, to demonstrate his righteousness. Whose righteousness? The Son and the Father. Their righteousness. You see, they can't grade on the curve. 99.9% .9 of righteousness doesn't get you into heaven. It's got to be perfect righteousness. Who can satisfy that? Only one, God Himself. So what does this sacrifice in the Old Testament mean? These sacrifices that we had of Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and then after the law, David. Those were sins of the past. What were those offerings all about? Here's what they were all about. Non-effectual. That's what they were all about. Non-effectual. Think about them this way. You put your hand over your heart. You stand and give pledge of allegiance. Loyalty. Covenant faithfulness to your country. And what it stands for. That's what they were doing. Covenant loyalty to God. As He had revealed Himself to them at that time. That's what they were doing. And God says the Apostle. Ah, look at that word forbearance. You see that word? He left those sins unpunished. He passed over them. Because he saw the Son and the finished work of the Son. What's the logic of the verse? That all sin must be punished. Now. Now the pieces are coming together. Now we see the picture. Now Paul writes Romans 8.1 There is no condemnation for those of us in Christ. Why? Because somebody else took the punishment in our place substitution 
the second person of the Trinity. He has done the work. And what was the work? Proverbs 16, 26. It was suffering work. It was travail work. It was his labor of life. Satisfied in the Old Testament scholars said satisfied as to a given result. You can't add anything to it. The New Testament writers called it propitiation. The demands of a righteous God are fully met. So said our Lord Jesus Christ back to our publican. The parable, it says, He went away. There was no atonement. He made no offering. It came right here. Now you understand what David meant when there was no sacrifice for what he had done. Murder, adultery, here it is, said David, Psalm 51, 17, My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a contrite heart. O God, you will not despise. You'll never kick that out. Now, my friends, you see it. The toiler is the Christ. His appetite wasn't, he said, for food or drink. My appetite, he said, was to do the will of my Father in heaven. In his mouth was the strong, assertive voice that urged him on. Listen to these words of John 6.26. The people ask him, what must we do to do the work that God requires? And here was Christ's answer. Verse 29, the work, the labor, the toil that God requires is believe on the one whom he sent. My friends, he's the toiler, not you. All of the works, all of these acts of righteousness that these religions produce are nothing. They're vain. We have had one toiler, one worker in all of creation. And he was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's the proverb. And now you learn something. And I learned something that I never thought I would stumble into. Jesus the Christ is the worker of the prophet. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the study of your word and how it teaches us and how it exhorts us in our communication and in our daily walk, never to lean on our own understanding, always to listen to you, always to follow you, for you are our Savior, the one who satisfied the righteousness of God that we may be all free. In Jesus' name, amen.